Good afternoon and welcome to another webinar sponsored by the North American Vascular Biology Organization. I'm Enar Cuervo from the University of Illinois at Chicago and a member of the Navajo Education Committee, and I will be moderating today's session. I am very pleased to welcome our speaker, Dr. Martin Swartz, Professor of Medicine in Cardiology and Professor of Biomedical Engineering and of Cell Biology. Martin Swartz earned a BA in Chemistry from the New College in Sarasota, Florida, and a PhD in Physical Chemistry from Stanford, where he worked in Hardin McConnell's lab on biophysics of phospholipid membranes. He did postdoctoral research in biology at MIT in the laboratory of Richard Hines, where he studied interactions of fibronectin with cells and other proteins. He was on the faculty at Harvard Medical School, Scripps Research Institute, and the University of Virginia prior to moving to Yale in 2011. Starting in the 1980s, his lab was among the first to report that integrand-mediated addition could regulate signaling pathways in cells, that integrand-mediated addition promotes cell survival, that integrins synergize with growth factor receptors to activate growth signaling pathways and regulate rho family GTPases. His lab has also elucidated mechanotransduction pathways by which endothelial cells respond to fluid shear stress to activate inflammatory pathways linked to atherosclerosis. His current research program combines studies using biophysical, cellular, and animal approaches to address important questions about integrin signaling, mechanical transduction, and disease in the vascular system. And the way we're going to handle the questions today is in two different ways. Throughout the presentation, you can type your question in the question box in the control panel. These questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. At the end the, of the question and answer period, provided that there's time, attendees will be able to ask any additional questions live in real time. So if you have a question, please raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon on the left side of your control panel. You will be recognized, your mic will be unmuted, and then you will be able to ask your question live. If you experience any technical problems, click the help tab at the top of the control panel and then scroll to the bottom of the help screen for the GoToWebinar technical support phone number. This webinar is recorded and archived uh, on the NABO website for future use. So without further ado, let's uh, welcome Dr. Swartz. Yeah, well, thank you for the invitation and um, for all of you who have tuned in. Um, Thank you as well. I, I know that you could be watching Game of Thrones reruns right now, so I'm I'm flattered. Um, I'm going to oh, can I get my screen to move? Oops. Okay, I am stuck on the screen. That's not the best thing. Um, okay, I can't get off here. Uh, any any advice? Um, when we tried it earlier, oh, there we go. Okay, now we're advancing. Okay, so the beginning of this story, um, and I'm, I'm going to give you a historical perspective, begins with the observation that atherosclerosis is driven by systemic risk factors that you all know about, um, high LDL cholesterol and, and diabetes and so on and so forth. But the disease itself um, originates preferentially in regions of our arteries that are subject to disturbances in fluid shear stress. And the way this works is that straight parts of arteries that have high laminar shear stress are protected from these inflammatory and metabolic risk factors. And the curves and branches where flow magnitude is lower and where there are, are changes in direction during the cardiac cycle are susceptible. And we ended up um, really toward the, the late 1990s with two collaborations that launched this entire 20-year project. And the first collaboration was with Xu Chen, and we ended up publishing a paper that suggested that new integrin binding played a role in fluid shear stress uh, sensing and signaling by endothelial cells. And around the same time, um, Sandy Fatil's lab, who was right down the hall from me at Scripps, developed an, an engineered um, FAB fragment that specifically binds to the activated, unoccupied state 
of integrin alpha V beta three. And Ellie Tsima came to my lab and began using that antibody. And what Ellie found is that when you apply shear stress to endothelial cells, you trigger integrin activation. And those active high affinity integrins bind to whatever matrix proteins are in the endothelial basement membrane. And some fraction of the flow signals are derived through this integrin pathway. And Ellie then went on uh, to use the integrin activation assay as a readout to map, to, to work backwards and map the pathway. And that's how Ellie um, discovered the junctional complex that plays an important role in fear stress sensing and launched her career. So she's um, now a professor at, at Oxford uh, back in England. And um, I was interested in this notion that, that integrin ligation played a role in shear stress signaling um, for the reason that endothelial basement membranes are not always the same. And to sort of make a broad um, generalization, in stable vessels, the basement membrane is made principally of the classic basement membrane proteins, um, laminin and type four collagen and, and a few other things. But in remodeling vessels, either undergoing angiogenesis or inflammation or uh, various developmental processes, fibronectin and other provisional matrix proteins are deposited in that basement membrane. So when a guy named Wayne Orr uh, came to my lab as a postdoc in the early 2000s, um, he did what turned out to be a, a really a, a, a tremendously seminal experiment. And first of all, Wayne took sections through arteries of wild type mice, and he observed that wherever there was disturbed flow in atheroprone regions of arteries, and you can see there's some endothelial inflammation um, markers, ICAM and VCAM, are expressed in these atheroprone regions. There is also some fibronectin uh, deposited um, beneath the endothelial cells in the same regions. And the experiment, a series of experiments that, that Wayne did, was to take endothelial cells and plate them on different matrix proteins and apply shear stress and look at the signaling outputs. And the signaling outputs that he picked are a number of different things that are associated with inflammatory activation of the endothelium that drives expression of leukocyte adhesion receptors and cytokines and so on. And what he saw is if the endothelial cells were sitting on uh, proteins typical of basement membranes, so this could be collagen or laminin or what, what we eventually settled on as, as our a marker as our matrix was diluted matrigel. So that's basically basement membrane material uh, diluted and coated onto glass or plastic. That the basement membrane collagen uh, matrix was anti-inflammatory. That is, it, it either suppressed or at least didn't activate any of these inflammatory mediators. But if the cells were sitting on fibronectin, um, and also it turns out fibronectin, fibrinogen, um, flow had a strong inflammatory effect. And you will notice in, in these figures that it's really night and day, that it's um, absolutely not inflammatory on basement membrane and, and fairly potently inflammatory on fibronectin. And um, there's a couple of reasons why that might be interesting. Um, there have been a number of mouse genetic studies that implicate fibronectin uh, both in normal remodeling processes. So here's a paper from Jane Sotile where they found that disrupting fibronectin matrix assembly um, impeded vascular remodeling. And there's a number of mouse genetic studies where they delete a specific isoform of fibronectin that reduces the total amount of fibronectin that's available and that's deposited into artery walls. And in all of those studies, there is a reduction in plaque size. So fibronectin contributes both to normal vascular remodeling um, and also to this pathological remodeling um, that we call atherosclerosis. And Wayne went on to study the pathways. And, and what he discovered 
Um, this was started in my lab and then finished off in his independent lab at LSU, is that cyclic A and P is the critical mediator. And the way this works is if cells are sitting on collagen or basement membrane and they are exposed to flow, there is a spike of cyclic A and P accumulation and a spike of protein kinase A activation, whereas both of those were completely suppressed on fibronectin. And this paper goes on to demonstrate that the cyclic AMP mediates the anti-inflammatory effect on basement membrane, which is relieved in cells on fibronectin. So Wayne went on in his own lab to publish a, a whole long series of beautiful studies that describe the importance of fibronectin in, in disease. And, and there's a list of Wayne's papers. Um, and when Wayne left the lab, uh, this guy, sang Yun, yun um, came and, and picked up a different aspect of the problem. And I should say that sang -ok, um left uh, my lab and has started his own lab in, in Korea, actually just a, a couple of months ago. Um, and what sang -ok found is, is that there is a cyclic AMP hydrolyzing uh, phosphatase, uh, phosphodiesterase, called PDE4D5. That's the, the most highly expressed uh, phosphodiesterase in endothelial cells. And it binds directly to the cytoplasmic tail of integrin alpha-5, which is the main fibronectin receptor in these cells. And uh, what you see on the left there is a, a pull down with purified proteins that show that the alpha-5 tail directly binds um, a, a bacterially produced uh, phosphodiesterase fragment. On the right, you see a co-IP that shows that if you immunoprecipitate integrins, you pull down um, PDE with the wild type alpha-5 and not with a cytoplasmic domain mutant. So the idea here is that the phosphatase is recruited to the integrin alpha-5 tail and then hydrolyzes the cyclic AMP to relieve this anti-inflammatory effect of cyclic AMP and protein kinase A. And in order to explore the biology of, of this signaling pathway, uh, sang -ok, um, made a chimera of, of the alpha-5 integrin with the anti-inflammatory collagen binding alpha-2 integrin. So he made this, this integrin, which is alpha-5 on the outside, so it binds fibronectin, but it's alpha-2 on the inside, so it signals as if the cells were bound to collagen or, or laminin. And if that chimeric integrin is expressed in endothelial cells and they are treated with a variety of um, inflammatory stimuli, um, in, in here what I'm showing you is either oscillatory shear um, or interleukin-1 beta, what you see is that wild-type alpha-5 in cells on fibronectin supports activation of NF-kappa-B, whereas if the cells express the chimera, um, NF-kappa-B is inhibited. So indeed, this, this integrin, um, by modulating alpha-5 signals um, or altering alpha-5 signals, is anti-inflammatory. And that finding in vitro prompted us to make a mouse. Um, this is a, a knock-in mouse in which the alpha-5 cytoplasmic domain was replaced with that of alpha-2. And those mice are happy and healthy. And if you breed them into APOEs and put them on a, a McDonald's cheeseburger diet, um, they develop less atherosclerotic plaque than the normal APOE minus mice. Plaques are smaller. Um, we also did some hind limb ischemia uh, experiments, and they recover from hind limb ischemia a little bit faster than wild type mice. So indeed, in vivo, this integrin mutation is anti-inflammatory. And um, there's a paper that I showed you earlier, but didn't say much about it. Um, this is a paper from Reinhard Fassler's lab where he reports that when you genetically delete plasma fibronectin, um, atherosclerotic plaques become smaller. However, they also um, have show, show evidence of instability. So the fibrous cap becomes thinner and, and they had evidence for plaque rupture in this study. 
And that, that made us wonder whether this signaling through alpha-5 might also contribute to um, fibrous cap formation, which uh, led us to examine our mice carefully for markers of plaque stability and instability. And in fact, what we found is that um, there was no evidence for plaque instability. If anything, there's a rather substantial decrease in MMP expression. Um, there's also a, a more modest decrease in uh, recruitment of immune cells. So we think that the, the pathway diagram here um, is that fibronectin does two things. Um, it signals through integrin alpha-5, and that signaling suppresses cyclic AMP and uh, is permissive of inflammatory signaling. But fibronectin is also a component of the matrix, and it's well known that fibronectin binds and pr promotes um, assembly of fibrillar collagens. So we think that the deletion of fibronectin itself most likely leads to uh, fibrous cap thinning um, because of this effect on, on collagen fibril assembly, whereas the integrin alpha-5 signaling contributes to the inflammatory character of the plaque. So Songok went on um, and mapped the alpha-5 binding site on the phosphodiesterase, and he was able to map that binding site to a short sequence um, in the connecting region between the N-terminal regulatory domains and the catalytic domain. And he found that if you mutated those four basic residues, you um, made a phosphodiesterase that would no longer um, pull down uh, with uh, PDE with, with integrin alpha-5 fragments and also would not co-IP. And that led us to make another mouse. So Song Oak uh, used CRISPR and made a PDE mutant mouse in which the integrin binding site was mutated. And those mice were also crossed into APOEs and put on a high fat diet. These mice again have smaller plaques um, and when carefully examined for markers of stability, um, they have plaques that show a, a actually rather substantial decrease in um, density of immune cells, um, a decrease in expression and activation of MMPs, and a slightly thicker fibrous cap. So that provides some significant backup evidence um, that, that this pathway through integrin alpha-5 and PDE4D5 is an important um, anti, uh, an important inflammatory pathway that, that governs this effect of fibronectin. So the question then became, um, how does binding integrin alpha-5 regulate PDE activity? And remember that I've, I've shown you already that there are global changes in the total levels of cyclic AMP. P, which suggests that it's more than just a targeting effect. It must be that, that um, fibronectin and integrin alpha-5 uh, regulate the activity of the enzyme. Um, and what song Oak found is that there is an inhibitory phosphorylation site on, on PDE45. It's the serine 579. And, and that phosphorylation was low in cells on fibronectin. It was higher in cells on collagen. It was also high in cells on fibronectin if you mutate the alpha-5 binding site. And I'm not showing it here, but I'll just tell you that if you take cells in suspension and plate them on fibronectin, as they stick and spread on the fibronectin, the site is relatively rapidly dephosphorylated. So it, it seems that binding alpha-5 regulates um, perhaps a, a, a phosphatase that controls phosphorylation on that site. Um, Sung Oak went on to test uh, the functional significance of that phosphorylation event by um, taking our endothelial cells, knocking down the endogenous uh, PDE4D, and then rescuing either with the wild type or with a phosphomimetic state that would mimic the phosphorylated form um, on collagen or basement membrane. And what he saw is that, um, on, that normally um, oscillatory shear will activate NF-kappa B. That does not happen if you knock down PDE4D5. So you need, need PDE4D5 for this inflammatory effect of, of flow, 
You can rescue by re-expression of the wild type, but you can't rescue by re-expression of the phosphomimetic mutant. So that's the key functional result. The question then became, uh, what mediates uh, this loss of phosphorylation? And Sung Oak decided to do a um, somewhat audacious uh, proteomic experiment. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, it should, it should say serine uh, 579, not 651. That's a typo. Um, or, or uh, hold on. I, uh, Anyway, okay, so um, what, what he did is he took our phosphomimetic PDE um, with the thinking that that would serve as a phosphatase trapping mutant that couldn't be dephosphorylated and the phosphatase would, would glom on and, and not dissociate. So he expressed um, this mutant in cells. He plated the cells either on fibronectin or matrigel, and then he immunoprecipitated the, the GFP uh, PDE mutant and looked for fibronectin-specific proteins. And if you can see that fuzzy band there at around 55 kD, um, he cut that out and sent it for sequencing, and it came back as the B55 alpha subunit of um, the PP2A complex. So to give you a little background, um, PP2A is one of the major phosphatase complexes in, in all mammalian cells. Um, it is made of three subunits. There's a, a catalytic subunit of, of which there's only two isoforms. There's um, a, an anchoring subunit, the A subunit of which there's two isoforms. And then there's this um, somewhat uh, more more uh, varied B subunit, I think there are 24 isoforms that serve as a regulatory and targeting subunit. And PP2A uh, family phosphatases dephosphorylate quite a large fraction of the uh, phosphocytes in cells, and one gets some degree of specificity by um, having this variety of B subunits that, that target it to different sites. And what you see in the right panel um, is just the uh, confirmation of that mass spec result um, by Western blotting. And indeed, what you see is that these three subunits, the catalytic B55 alpha and A subunit, um, all come down um, on fibronectin, but not on matrigel. And to test that functionally, Song Oak knocked down B55 alpha subunit. Um, he found that when you knock down B55 alpha, um, the PDE phosphorylation went way up. And again, to test whether this is regular, uh, relevant to inflammation, um, he looked at NF-kappa B. Um, and in, in, again, um, knocking down B55 alpha blocks the flow induction, flow activation of NF-kappa B, and that is rescued by re-expression of B55 alpha. Um, incidentally, B55 alpha also localizes to focal adhesions and does so more strongly on fibronectin than matrigel. So all of this is consistent with the notion that this phosphatase complex is specifically recruited um, to fibronectin integrins um, in endothelial cells under flow. So in the course of doing these experiments, uh, Sung Oak uh, accidentally observed something that was uh, very surprising. Um, and that is that fibronectin seems to promote the interaction of B55 alpha with the other subunits. So this is an ex or a pair of experiments um, where either cells are in suspension or plated on fibronectin or plated on fibronectin versus matrigel. And, and then B55 alpha or the catalytic subunit is immunoprecipitated. And what you see is that, that on fibronectin, this trimeric uh, PP2A complex assembles, and on matrigel or in suspension, it doesn't. So this has never been seen before in the phosphatase field, the notion that there's a receptor that drives assembly of a complex is, is a new and, and pretty interesting idea. Um, and that idea, together with the fact that 
these phosphatases are relatively few and have a great many substrates led us to wonder if there might be other relevant substrates. And um, although there are, you know, sort of higher throughput uh, methods in, in my career, probably the most effective method of, of screening has been um, guessing. And the substrate we guessed at was YAP. And the basis for the guess is, is partly that there's a tiny shred of data that YAP might be a PP2A substrate. YAP had also been strongly linked to atherosclerosis and disturbed flow. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this pathway, YAP is the ultimate effector of the HIPPO pathway. There are these upstream kinases activated by uh, tension and density and cell-cell interactions that phosphorylate and inactivate YAP and its homolog TAS. Um, that inactivation uh, results in ubiquitination and degradation. Um, if the HIPPO pathway is, is turned off, uh, YAP is dephosphorylated, goes to the nucleus, it turns on some large number of genes. In endothelial cells, those genes include um, a, a list of, of inflammatory mediators. So there are these, these previous papers that link um, YAP in endothelial cells to inflammatory gene expression and atherosclerosis. So sung -ok did this very simple experiment of plating our endothelial cells on fibronectin or matrigel and looking for a phosphorylation of YAP. And in, in, indeed, uh, plating on fibronectin was sufficient to dephosphorylate YAP on a critical regulatory site. Um, when we did functional experiments with B55 alpha knockdown and PDE knockdown, we found that that YAP dephosphorylation um, required uh, B55 alpha and PDE 4D. Um, both knockdowns resulted in increased YAP phosphorylation. Um, and we got a similar set of results when we looked for YAP downstream target genes. Um, flow activates those target genes, and the flow activation of gene expression is blocked both by B55 alpha knockdown and by PDE knockdown. Um, and then the last uh, sort of molecular experiment that Sung Oak did was to ask whether uh, YAP is a direct target of um, the PP2A complex. And to do that, what he, he purified um, phosphorylated YAP from cells. Um, he got some PP2A catalytic subunit and some purified B55 alpha and, and mixed them and looked for YAP phosphorylation. And what he saw is that YAP started out being phosphorylated. If you threw in uh, just the catalytic subunit, there was no change in phosphorylation, but there is a dose-dependent dephosphorylation when you add in B55 alpha. So that's quite strong evidence that YAP is a direct um, target of PP2A complex um, only when associated with B55 alpha. And then the last experimental data that I'm going to show you um, is we now, we had these PDE mutant mice, and according to our model, um, there should be less uh, YAP phosphorylation and, and more YAP degradation um, in, in the PDE mutant mice. So if you look in wild type mice, you can look in an atheroprotected region um, in the endothelium, here's the outer curvature, and we can look at the um, atherosusceptible inner curvature, and there is pretty distinct um, accumulation of YAP in the inner curvature, um, in, indicative of, of its high phosphorylation and protection from uh, degradation. If we look in the PDE mutant, that accumulation of YAP in the atheroprone inner curvature um, is, is strongly reduced. So this supports the notion that signaling through this alpha-5 PDE um, PP2A pathway in, indeed regulates YAP phosphorylation and activity. So um, the kind of simple model that, that one can draw based on all of these data is that a fibronectin matrix is pro-inflammatory 
because the integrin that binds, integrin alpha 5 beta 1, interacts with this, phos this phosphodiesterase PDE4 D5. And um, PDE4 D5 is thereby activated and degrades cyclic AMP, but it also serves as an adapter complex that results in assembly of one of the major uh, phosphatase complexes in the cell, this B55-alpha containing PP2A complex. That complex is also recruited to focal adhesions where it uh, dephosphorylates other substrates. The substrate that we um, came upon was YAP, which when dephosphorylated goes to the nucleus and is, is part of the endothelial activation uh, pathway in, in atherosclerosis. And while we were sorting through these detailed molecular pathways, um, there's, there's been a, a, a growing paradigm in the atherosclerosis field. And it stems uh, both from um, uh, human genetic studies um, as, as well as um, biological studies. So as, as you know, there's been um, many GWAS studies to identify uh, genes that are um, markers for atherosclerosis. One of the early genes that was uh, discovered in, in these GWAS studies was collagen-4. So collagen-4 uh, SNPs have a, a, a quite strong linkage to um, atherosclerosis. But what Ruth McPherson's lab then did was instead of looking for single genes that have um, a, a sufficient statistical threshold to be associated, I think it's a p-value of 10 to the minus eight, she did a systems analysis where instead of looking for single genes, she looked for linked genes. She looked for uh, pathways that, that had a, an association. And when she did that, there were three pathways that rose to the top. Um, the two pathways are the obvious ones that, that you all know about. Um, so that's inflammation um, and, and lipid metabolism. And the third pathway that was about equal was a pathway that involved TGF beta signaling and matrix and matrix remodeling. Um, so when you broaden your genetic analysis, um, it seems that TGF beta signaling and, and fibronectin, which is a downstream TGF beta gene um, are supported by the human genetics. And, and um, Mike Simon's lab um, has been studying that in the context of um, endo-MT, endothelial to mesenchymal transition. Um, and, and he has published a series of papers in uh, this case with our help um, that shows that in fact, endo-MT is a significant driver of atherosclerosis. Mouse model correlates um, in these. So studies uh, on in, in my lab, a new lab in Korea. Uh, Song Oak has done a phosphoproteomic screen uh, to look for phosphorylation sites that are regulated through this fibronectin integrin PP2A pathway. And um, I will just casually tell you that we have about 100 hits um, that seem to be regulated. Sangok has validated a handful of them, um, and we are in the middle of testing their biological relevance, but we are seeing some very interesting things. It's clear that there's a, a whole long list of um, interesting players that, whose phosphorylation is regulated through this pathway. Um, the second ongoing direction is we are putting our mutant mice through a number of disease models. Um, and at present, um, we have interesting data, uh, both on, on diabetes and in um, aneurysm models that suggest that these mice um, are resistant to these diseases, all of which involve um, amplified fibronectin um, assembly and, and gene expression in, in vessels. And then we are just beginning a project um, to try to understand um, the other fibronectin receptor and, and the fibrin receptor integrin alpha B beta 3, which also has anti-inflammatory effects or pro, excuse me, pro-inflammatory effects. 
um, but does not interact with PDE. So that's that's the story. Um, really, uh, the the last the eight years of this work has been driven almost entirely by one uh, really superb postdoc, uh, Sango Gyun, um, with a bit of help. Uh, Madhu Budata did um, some of the animal work that I have shown you, um, and a, a number of other people contributed. Uh, George Bailey in Glasgow was our um, PDE collaborator, and David Pallas at Emory um, has been our PP2A collaborator. And I will stop there and take questions. Thank you so much, Martin. That was a fantastic talk. And we have a lot of questions from the audience. So the first question is from um, Mabruka Alfadi. She's asking, how does PD45 uh, phosphorylate? Is it phosphorylation dependent solely on shear stress? Uh, does SHP2 dephosphorylate PD45? Thank you. Well, I already showed you that PP2A dephosphorylates um, that site on, on the phosphodiesterase. So um, I, I think that's the answer to your question. We have another question. This one is uh, from Bill Muller. So he congratulates you. Great talk, Martin. In the in vitro flow studies you spoke of early on, have you ever tried adding laminin 511 versus 411 to fibronectin to determine whether they alter pro-inflammatory characteristics of fibronectin? There is evidence that they alter inflammatory outcomes in post-capillary venules, where flow is substantially lower than the levels you use. Yeah, first time. Uh, good question. Uh, I've never done experiment five uh, laminin. Um, I think our results support the notion that one is doing the same. Um, I guess to really note how much of the effect through versus through type. The in the note however Martin, we're having trouble hearing you. If if you don't mind uh, trying to double check that your mic is well and, and repeating the answer, please. Sure, okay. Um, so the whole answer was, hi, Bill. Uh, I would say we, we have definitely not looked at different isoforms of laminin in, in vivo um, in, or in, in vitro. Um, you know, of course, all of these in vivo studies support the notion that the endothelial basement membranes are anti-inflammatory in arteries. Um, we have done experiments in vitro with a, you know, a number of different types of endothelial cells from different species and different locations. And the effects that I've described here seem to be well conserved among all of the endothelial cells we've, we've looked at. Um, so, so maybe those are kind of a, a partial answer um, in, in substitution for the detailed answer that you looked at, that you asked for. Um, but I have to correct one thing that you said, and that is that um, shear stress is proportional both to flow velocity, um, but inversely proportional to the diameter of vessels. So although capillaries have a slower flow, they do not have lower shear stress. So because their diameters are so much smaller, it's thought that the shear stress in capillaries is actually about the same as it is in large arteries. Okay, thank you so much, Martin. There is another question uh, from Rita Alivriadu, um, and she's asking, is the dephosphorylation of YAP within one hour of oscillatory shear stress enough to drive the pro phenotype? Will this work even if the cells are cultured on gelatin and exposed to oscillatory shear stress? And she's asking this because most labs just culture endothelial cells on gelatin and expose them to different flow types. Sure. Um, 
So gelatin is an ambiguous substrate. And the reason it's ambiguous is that, well, yeah, it's sort of collagen, um, but it's denatured collagen um, that binds integrin alpha V beta 3 and also is pretty good at binding fibronectin, but evidently to some extent can bind um, the, the collagen binding integrins as well. And one of the hints very early on that, that put me onto this a whole pathway is that there were discrepancies in the literature and people who plated their endothelial cells on gelatin um, got different results than than we were seeing on fibronectin um, so i don't like to use gelatin because it's it's sort of neither fish nor fowl it's it's a little bit collagen like but but also not entirely um, and I think on, on gelatin, you get rather variable results, depending on how long the cells have been plated and where the gelatin comes from and so on and so forth. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, our next question comes from Saki al Yafai and is asking, how does flow induce cyclic IMP production? And do you think matrix could affect GPCR signaling in this context? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so it's in Song Oak's Nature Cell Biology paper that in his hands, um, and I, I think there's some uh, divergence in the literature on this depending on the time point, but there is, but the initial surge of cyclic AMP upon um, initiation of flow um, seems to go through synthesis of uh, PGI2. So, so prostacyclin has long been known um, to be an early event in flow signaling. Um, it's induced within, you know, a, a or two or three. And in Sung Oak's hands, if you blocked the synthesis of prostacyclin, you blocked this initial wave of, of G protein activation and cyclic AMP synthesis. Thank you very much. This next question is from Kishore Wary, and he's congratulating you. He enjoyed your presentation. And he says, I'm wondering if there are reports on mutations or polymorphisms in human PDE4D loci. Thank you, Kishore. Oh, um, yeah, actually, I, I don't know. I don't know the linkage between uh, PDE4D and um, atherosclerosis. Part of the issue is that PDE4D is widely expressed and does a lot of other things. Um, there's a lot of it in the brain. You can't give people uh, inhibitors of this class of enzymes because it has all kinds of bad side effects. Um, so uh, anyway, that's 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 my answer. Thank you. This next question is from Wayne Orr. He's asking, what are your thoughts on how ligated but not unligated alpha five beta one affects PP2A assembly? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the evidence is that it needs to be ligated. Um, you know, so, so cells in suspension uh, don't do any of this. It is quite plausible, and we haven't tested this hypothesis, but um, it's reasonable that an unligated inactive integrin, the alpha and beta tails interact um, and you need to get leg separation and freeing of the tails in order to get ligands bound. So um, the legs separate in order to get tail and binding, and I would anticipate that the alpha has to dissociate from the beta in order to get um, ligands that bind the, the alpha-5 tail as well. Thank you. The next question is from Elliot Sima. It seems all your trainees are here, Martin, today. Really? Yeah. Um, great talk as always, Martin, she says. Uh, is PDE45... Sorry, sorry, can you say that with a, a British accent? Oh, I'm not sure. I'm from Spain, so I'm already struggling with not having an accent on my English. I can try. Great talk as always, Martin. Martin. Um, is the PDE45 phosphorylation PCOM1 dependent? Oh, I don't think we've ever looked at that. Um, it's not flow dependent, so probably not. 
Um, if you just take cells, you know, in the absence of flow and just plate them on fibronectin, it gets dephosphorylated. So, so I would not anticipate any requirement for um, components of the flow signaling pathway. All right, the next question is from Swati Ailo. Since phytonectin and fibronectin share integrin receptors, I am curious if there is any relationship between phytonectin signaling of integrins compared to fibronectin. Is there any crosstalk or influence of these two signaling pathways? Yeah, okay. Um, I, I suppose the simple answer is that I'm curious as well. Um, we we have not done very much with alpha V beta three. It's it's something that I have kind of been interested for a long time, um, and you know we just made the tactical decision to go after alpha five beta one in depth rather than dividing our efforts. Um, so um, my. Let's see. So, so, so Wayne Orr had a, a paper um, in Molecular Biology of the Cell that presented some data suggesting that the so that the fibronectin binding integrins, um, if they don't help each other, they at least don't compete or um, inhibit each other. Where there does seem to be some sort of inhibitory interaction between the fibronectin binding integrins and the basement membrane binding integrins, which again, it's, it's not a very detailed or complete um, answer to your question, but I think that, that alpha-5 beta-1 and alpha-v beta-3 um, you know, do not inhibit each other, let's put it that way. Thank you. This next question is from David Harrison. Endothelial cells make an O in response to shear, which in turn inhibits NF-kappa-B signaling. Is the effect of fibronectin um, on PDE4D5 in part mediated or modulated by an O? Great talk. Yeah, um, so, so Wayne really should be answering this question rather, rather than me. Um, so Wayne has a, a very nice paper, and I think it was one of the papers that I listed on my slide there. Um, that fibronectin regulates um, NO production. Um, so cells on so so if you like fibronectin is sufficient to induce endothelial dysfunction. Um, endothelial cells on fibronectin produce less NO um, than on basement membrane. Um, whether PDE is directly a part of that, I guess we we have we have never specifically looked. But but I would almost be surprised if it weren't. Thank you. The next question is from Micah Freyer. Uh, she asks, have you analyzed the impact of changes in matrix stiffness on the identified regulatory pathways? Yeah, um, we have not. Um, that's in the literature. Cynthia Reinhardt King has done some of that. Um, I I think the literature is fairly clear in saying that stiff matrices um, are pro-inflammatory and make things a little bit worse, but we have never gotten into that. Thank you. The next question is from Yoshito Yamashiro. How does flow share stress promotes binding fibronectin to integrin? And how fibronectin sense and distinguish laminar and disturbed flow? Okay, so the first question is easy. Um, so so Elit Sima worked out a pathway that involved PI3 kinase. So um, flow activates PI3 kinase. PI3 kinase and AKT are well known to be upstream of integrin conformational activation. Um, and, and we haven't taken it any further than that. The second question um, is, is, a, is a wonderful question. Um, and if, if I can summarize I would say what's in the literature and, and my feelings about it um, without anyone really knowing the detailed answer. Um, there was a pretty interesting paper from Stefan Offermans uh, recently that talked about piezo and um, the difference between disturbed flow and laminar flow. But, but to sort of summarize the whole gamish, 
Um, what we think is that the initial response to onset of laminar flow and oscillatory or disturbed flow is, is essentially identical. And what happens is that in laminar flow, the cells uh, align and orient in the direction of flow and, and they turn off the inflammatory pathways. Whereas in oscillatory flow, they never align. Um, they continue to be stimulated by these, um, call them off axis flows and the system keeps churning. And I suspect that in the oscillatory flow, um, there is, is continual integrin uh, binding turnover, whereas in the um, long-term laminar flow, things settle down into an established state with less turnover and less new binding and, and a loss of this new integrin signaling. Um, so what I just said is um, partly hypothetical um, and, and partly based on um, you know, all sorts of, of sort of you know, published and unpublished and um, anyway, I, I think that's probably the right answer and we should do a better job of uh, proving it. Thank you. The next question is from Kamba Rasa. Uh, does fibronectin relative to other substrates affect the distribution of actin, uh, actin stress fibers under flow? Thank you. Yeah, no. Um, so, you know, um, we, we did observe, and, and this is a, a, you know, one of our published papers, that cells will align on fibronectin a little faster than they will align on uh, collagen. But the basic cytoskeletal responses seem to be conserved. So we think that, that all of the integrins get activated in response to flow. And um, you know, what, what differs is not the conserved pathways that go through the beta-1 cytoplasmic domain, but the non-conserved pathways that go through the alpha cytoplasmic domain. And the, the beta is the main determinant of, of cytoskeletal reorganization. Thank you. We have a question from John Bieber, and he says, congratulations, Dr. Swartz, on your great talk. I am John Bieber from the University at Buffalo, a student under um, Yongo Bay. Do you think that integrin beta-1 phosphorylation that recruits PDE has any cross-regulation with fat-dependent mechanosignaling? Thank you for your time. Right. Well, I never said anything about integrin beta phosphorylation. Um, so, uh, you know, FAC interacts with the beta subunit. Um, PDE interacts with the alpha subunit. So as near as we can tell, they are independent events. Thank you. And this is our last question for today. Uh, it comes from Swati Aldo. You mentioned fibronectin is vascular basement membrane is increased in aging and diabetes. Do you mm. think this could be a reason for basement membrane thickening in diabetic retinopathy? Yes, I do. Um, we, you know, we are not looking at um, fibronectin uh, mutants, but we are looking at the alpha-5 mutants, and um, they are less susceptible to, to diabetic um, vascular complications. So, yeah, so there's a lot of fibronectin in those thickened basement membranes. Um, and, and we suspect that its signaling properties are important. Thank you so much, Martin. We really appreciate all the time you have for questions and this fantastic talk. Um, for all of you attendees, thank you for being here. I hope you found this research presentation as um, awesome as I did. Uh, Martin Schwartz will be participating in a live discussion on tissue stiffness on June 1. So if you still have comments or if you wish to further discuss your questions with him, please um, connect with us on June 1st. Um, these webinars and the panel discussion are brought to you by the NAVO Education Committee. Our next webinar is on Thursday, June 11th uh, at 1 and Eastern time with Mary Wallingford from Tufts University School of Medicine. And she will talk to us about essential yet transient, um, an introduction to the placental circulatory system. So look for the registration to the webinar in the NABO Newsbeat newsletter. Also, please 
fill out the go to webinar evaluation form when you receive it in a subsequent email and let us know what you think about the go to webinar format and if there is any topics you may want to see in a future NABO webinar. Thank you everyone and have a good day. Yeah, cool.